Um, so my, for my final question, um, and a lot of you have touched on this already, um, what are your thoughts around this statement? Identity is not enough. Community is an intentional process that cannot be assumed. It is something that you earn, that you build on, that you grow into, and that you practice. And when I was thinking about this question, um, it was, well, one, I was probably mad about some kind of situation of tokenization. Um, and two, uh, I was thinking about how, um, well, there's a phone call coming. Okay. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about how um, in, <laughs> I need the phone to be answered or something. Um, yes, I was thinking about how um, just because um, folks of color and black folks and in, like indigenous folks um, are oppressed and marginalized in the same ways, um, doesn't mean that there's like this instant um, kind of relationship that we have. Um, and, and all of you have kind of touched upon that. Um, and so when I think about, um, and again, these aren't terrible things. When I, think about, when I think about solidarity from like the very contemporary sense where we're like sharing other people's like posters and like photos um, of, you know, like, wanting to um, feel empathetic to another marginalized person's experience, even though you might not necessarily feel the same. Um, this is a good thing, but there's, there's something beyond it. And we, as folks of color, as, as BIPOC, um, we constantly, um, or at least from what I've been seeing, we've constantly been telling white folks, this is how you should be doing things. Um, and these are the right ways of doing it, and these are the wrong ways of doing it. Um, but everyone kind of have, has their own sets of how to navigate those spaces. Um, and their own sets of like what triggers them. Um, and so it's, it's confusing. Um, and, uh, you know, in the past, like, not just in the past three weeks over the past little bit, I've been kind of delving in and questioning um, whether my solidarity with um, Black folks is legitimate. What relationships do I have in my life um, that are genuinely um, in towards like a pathway of true solidarity? Um, and what is solidarity in its like, how people have perceptions of like its purest form? Um, which is in itself kind of oppressive. Um, anyways, I'll stop there <laughs> and then maybe have you guys respond to that. Andy, sorry, could you drop the statement in the box? Yeah, sure. Thanks. I just need to think on it for two seconds. <laughs> so I guess I can go in the meantime, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so I think this is a really beautiful and important question. And it's one I've again been grappling with for a while. And this has a lot to do again with my job. Um, so I think after that experience of kind of like, um, and I guess for uh, as a bit of context to folks, I was um, leading uh, the federal government's engagement with Indigenous folks on the development of a new policy. Um, so for a while, I was really like liaising with a lot of Indigenous groups at the national, regional, local levels, um, going into communities and so on, and really, really, really grappling with what it means to be a settler um, and to be a Black woman settler. Um, and I really understood that, you know, my identity as a Black woman is not enough. Um, in order to really build those, those kinds of relationships that are built on trust, especially when you are, again, representing something that has caused so much harm. So I felt as though I really had to question whether or not I was building 
um, real relationships, whether or not I was actually acting from a place of solidarity. And I realized that I had to take a step back and really understand that solidarity is rooted in relationships. And that's where that whole idea for the exhibition really came from, because I understood, like, if I want to really question what it means to be here on this land in this moment, I have to build relationships right now. And I have to build them in ways that are, are rooted in a, a kind of desire to understand uh, one another and to, to really just be with one another. So really fundamentally shifting the ways in which we um, understand when and where we come together. And that's where I was talking about, like not only around oppression, but also around pleasure, or around joy. Um, and we don't get that often. So one of the things that we did, for example, was to organize a, a feast that was just um, for black and indigenous women and two spirit folks. And it was amazing. Um, I felt as though I was in a position to really facilitate that kind of conversation because it was going to be also facilitated conversation over dinner. And what I did instead was um, with the Carleton University Art Gallery, um, they were really supportive and like provided me with all the resources. We hired two facilitators who were more, um, more skilled in kind of inter-community um, facilitation. So Muna Mohammed and um, Cole Paplinski. And they kind of organized um, the way in which the, the dinner would be set up. And they decided that there was going to be a sharing circle initially. And um, everything was just like when the event started, um, I had no control over everything. I was just sitting there. I was just like chilling with everyone. And, you know, they were leading the conversations. We had uh, Belma McGregor do an opening prayer and um, started off the sharing circle. And as soon as people were given the feather and just asked, like, share whatever you want, there was just like this outpouring of just sharing what, whatever it is that they wanted to share. And it was deep, it was so deep. And I felt as though we just crave that space. We crave that ability to connect with one another and to be, to be able to share the things that we struggled with. You know, there was a lot, and I'm not gonna share what we discussed because I think part of it was having that moment to ourselves and that privacy. Because again, oftentimes when we're brought together, it's talk about the things that are, are, are killing us quite literally. And to kind of like just share that, that pain. And it's often to an audience and there's this voyeurism um, that, that's so common in the moments in which like black and indigenous folks are, are, are brought together to talk about their pain in front of an audience. Um, and I didn't want that. So we, we did share some of that though, it privately, but afterwards what we did was we had a dinner and we talked and it was strangers meeting each other for the first time. It was my mom who has been here since 1998 and had never interacted with indigenous people, right? Having dinner for the first time with indigenous women and two spirit folk. You know, and just like, it was the most beautiful moment. And I carry that with me. And I, I think that it really has to be that. It has to be that intentionality in the ways in which we come together. It has to be an ability to question the space that we take and to be able to say, I'm going to take a step back because I, I don't know. I, I, there's so much more for me to unlearn. And there's so much more for me to learn. Um, and I think it requires a, a, a huge amount of humility. It requires a huge amount of kind of, again, understanding and navigating that compl uh, complicity that's very difficult and can feel very strenuous. And I think it's also made me that much more with everything that was going on in the States um, when there weren't people who weren't reaching out. For me, like if you know this is going on and you have black folks in your life, one of the things that you can do, the simplest thing you can do is to reach out to them and make sure that they're okay. And I had friends that I was very close to who didn't do that, and I, I called them out on it. Um, because that's that's all it takes. It's just that, that care and that love. Um, and so it, there's always that fear of making the wrong move. And I, I navigate that every single day. And when I was doing curating that exhibition, it was the same thing. Every single day, you're afraid of making a mistake. But it's important enough that you do it. And it takes work, and it takes intentionality, and it's not easy, but it's needed. Thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> Are you crying again? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, Andy and I cry so much together in public. I love it. True. Um, okay, so identity. I think, I think the whole issue of identity is so interesting because, because the one statement that I think about when I think about identity is, I don't know. There's so much that I don't know. There's so much that a lot of us don't know. 
about our stories. And again, as, as humans and as artists, what makes us who we are is our stories, our specific, particular individual stories. And over the course of a lifetime, you, you learn the story, you create the story, you accumulate, you research, you accumulate information. And in doing so, it's an act of proprioception. So you're, you're geolocating yourself based on my mother's story, uh, Andy's story, my son's story. Where am I? And my position shifts as I learn more and more about those around us. And so, again, this relates to what Hannah was saying about Kapwa and about the surface tension that exists understanding where I am in relation to everyone else, to, um, to other people's cultures as well, to the, to the dominant culture that we are, the, the Kool-Aid is being served to us out of our taps daily. I, I think that in order to get like cultural clarity and personal clarity, we are just, we're on, a road which is about which is constant practice of collecting information about others in order to understand where we are in relation to other people's stories and so in that way you know as cozy was saying as hannah was saying like we don't exist without each other um and in the same way you know a lot of um societal conventions don't exist black does not exist without brown or white um we these differences don't exist if we don't all exist in relation to each other and so the the task of constructing identity i think is about learning and listening and researching and un, and therefore understanding each other and anybody that you speak to can be part can be incorporated into your story and your practice of learning who it is that you are and what what the details of your own story our stories change every day every day we change and so education needs to be a part of that and as cozy was saying conversations with everybody are part of that how we how we respond to others and how we how we reflect upon the in the stories that we hear they all go into our little satchels into our little file folders of who we are um and who we are culturally i mean i feel like as a child of the diaspora there's so much that i don't know there was so much that was erased because assimilation was really important and it's a great shame for me. Um, and for a lot of, a lot of uh, diasporic people is that there's so much that I don't know about my family and not, it, not, not the fault of any of my, uh, my family. Um, as I said, the, the basic business of living um, takes up a lot of room. And so later in my life, I'm almost 50 is when I'm actually like trying to learn about who I am who my family is, what it means to be Filipina, because I'm a, I'm a hybrid. I'm a cultural hybrid. How, how do we do that without listening and without researching and without finding the information and, and understanding, understanding others and therefore understanding ourselves? There's, there are no categories. I mean, we've, we're all multi-hyphenates now, or we better be. Um, and that's a beautiful thing. It's, there's, 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 there is no, um, one monolithic way of being. We all know this. Um, and I think that as I get older, I realize it's okay to just keep adding more modifiers to my bio. It's fine. It's, it's, it's all part of like learning about my specific story. And the wonderful thing is, is meeting people like Andy and Christina Corey um, and Melanie Hugo, who are Filipina Canadians, Filipina Canadians, and realizing that their their experiences are different than mine. That that 
um, and that there are parallels as well. Um, and they're, they're beautiful, they're painful. Um, we're all different. It's, it's, identity is, it's so thorny. And, and, I, and I really think that the only way that we can, we can grapple with this is, is to listen to each other. Thank you, Marissa. Sorry, I went on. I rambled. No, no, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. So I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, uh, so for me, I, I kind of wanted to um, maybe, the, for the first part of your statement was identity is not enough. Um, and I, that really resonates with me because um, I come from, the perspective where I didn't know I was a brown person until I start, I became a photographer and I went into these like all white spaces um, for, you know, like the places that I work for. Um, um, and I, I was just so confused. It was like I was in a haze. And then when I started reading about it and when I started reading about, you know, um, all these intersections of why people treated me the way I was, or why people treated me um, was because of the way I looked, because of X, Y, and Z. I was just angry all the time. Um, and I was, you know, like I was very young and I was trying to sense make um, with my friends who, and my husband who's been experiencing all of those intersections growing up in America. Um, and the, my, my friend who is a reporter, who's a Filipino American reporter, she's like, honey, that's called critical thinking. And I was not, you know, I was not aware that, about all these things and I didn't have the language to articulate these things. And at first I was just very upset. And actually the first people who upset me were actually brown people too, you know, brown liberals, because they, expected me to know um know about all these isms that i just didn't know this was not part of my curriculum this was not part of how i was educated you know they were shaming me for listening to white people music or loving that you know and i was just like i, I don't know i just like that you know it, it was just it was i was so confused because i was also being othered in in those spaces with people who i thought would be safe for me um and and so there was a point in in time where I was just like, fuck that, you know, um, fuck all of that, you know, fuck liberal Western culture, because they aren't actually as inclusive as they pretend to be, you know, like they they want me to take on um, the narratives that they they want, but they don't actually include um, experiences of people that aren't part of their experience there. It felt like they had like some, you know. Um, oppression Olympics where, oh, but my experience is this, blah, blah, blah. and I was just like, I don't know, you know, I I, I don't know. And it was very hard. And I, I had a hard time with that because I felt like it was as exclusionary as, like it was the most exclusionary thing ever because it was the people who I thought would keep me safe and who would walk me through it. But instead they treated me like I was a dumb person for not internalizing that. Um, and it took me years because I had to translate that, you know, I had to read Western canons of identity politics and try to trans like form a translation for how that applies to where I'm coming from, to my background, to the people that I knew. Um, and I had to sort of like find a way to include different experiences to those canons um, that are, you know, seen by Western liberals as sort of bulletproof or infallible um but that's not how it felt instinctively to me and, you know and I, I read it and of course it makes perfect sense um but i think sometimes it becomes weaponized um and it becomes very um harmful for people who genuinely are in a different part of their path um and so i have the in quotes the privilege of of having remembered a time when I was not a racialized person, you know, I was just living in a pretty homogenous society, you know, obviously there's colorism, obviously I was a very brown Filipino, um, and that, that has its own different, that's its own different beast, um, but I remember a time when, when I 
knew that I wasn't dumb, that I knew that my intentions weren't ill, um, but I, I knew that um, there was a lot that I needed to work on. Um, and I think when, when we say, you know, identity is not enough, like we also have to understand that this is also one lens in seeing the world um, and that not all the lenses have been created yet. Um, we have the capacity to include more experiences. We have the capacity to take in um, narratives that aren't simple. Um, and, and we're doing a disservice to our sense of mission when we, when we oversimplify and, and we try to make systems um, that sort of put people in boxes that they don't belong in and ask them to fit in those boxes. Um, and so for me, I came to a point, um, obviously I'm not there anymore, but there was a point where I was just like, I don't want to engage in this anymore. You know what? I exist. I will be excellent in my work and that will be enough. I will take that space and I don't have to talk to other people about it. Um, and, you know, obviously I know that there's flaws in that too, because you, you do need to do the work of of engaging people, of challenging beliefs, of, you know, um, adding different perspectives, that is important work too. But there was a time where I was so exhausted by all this talk about identity, about, you know, gender, um, that I could not quite articulate in the way that made sense for me, because it wasn't, I didn't grow up in Western society. Um, and I, I just thought, all right, to hell with that. Um, and I think that that's a loss. You know, if if I if people like Andy didn't come and call me in and patiently listen to me and patiently help me, you know, um, understand, you know, what their perspective was and really listen to my perspective without coloring it to fit um, the boxes that she knew, then, you know, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here today um, taking up the space that, you know, that I'm taking. Um, and so for me, when we say identity is not enough, like that, that's what I think about because, um, you know, con community is also welcoming more perspectives that we might not even realize are there. Um, and when we engage in, in things that we don't know, when we come in, when, you know, solidarity is genuinely, you know, seeing um, other experiences and other stories and looking at that as equal and looking at that as, you know, valid and interesting and something that's worth engaging. When we come into the world with that openness and if we're actually willing to listen and not just be prescriptive of what we already believe, you know, that's really the only time that I think that these exchanges can genuinely bear fruit. Um, and part of that is really you know, welcoming, embracing, calling in, sharing pleasure, sharing joy, um, and not always making it about um, about um, our hurts, our pains, um, and actually, you know, coming together as as people. Um, yeah, so so I think that that's sort of where where I stand with that, and I'm very grateful for um, the fact of of the intentionality that I'm afforded in, in the communities that I get to build. Um, but that wouldn't have been possible if, if people didn't take that chance on me um, and first listened and first acknowledged and saw me as someone having a different experience um, and having a valid point of view and valid ideas. Thank you.